All right, so this morning we're going to begin by reading uh, Romans chapter 3. And actually, uh, if, if you have the, the translation or one of the translations of the Bible that uh, put Old Testament quotations in all caps, you'll probably notice that there is a section here that is in all caps. Uh, and some of this comes from the psalm that I read earlier this morning, uh, and you'll recognize it when I come to it. But it reminds us again of the condition of all men as we come into the world, what our condition was when we came into the world, but how the law was not able to help us. And that's essentially all that Luther had in those days, was the law to condemn him. Now, it was kind of like Pilgrim's Progress. Remember Moses as he goes after faithful and chases him up the hill, and, and when he reaches him, he's, he hits him and knocks him to the ground. And, and as, he's, as faithful is trying to stop him, Moses just keeps plump pummeling him with, with blows and was going to destroy him. Uh, and that's certainly not what Moses was like, but, but that was just a picture of what the law of God does to us. It can only beat us to the ground. It can only kill us. It can only condemn us. And that's all that Luther had because he didn't have the gospel. So let's, let's see again the purpose of the law because that's why God gave it. That's one of the reasons he gave it is to pummel us is to show us that we're dead, we're lost, we're without hope unless we turn to Jesus. Okay, so let's begin reading in John, or excuse me, Romans chapter 3 in verse 9. Uh, we're going to read verses 9 through, uh, 9 through 20, but we're going to just look at the truth that is in verses 19 and 20. So Paul says this, What then <clears throat> are we, that is the Jews, better than they, the, the Gentiles or the Greeks? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, it's that last phrase that I want us to, 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 to see. You know, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It doesn't bring salvation. It essentially closes every mouth so that everyone would become accountable to him. And notice it says, it speaks to those who are under the law, and under the law means under the law as a covenant of works, under the law in order to be justified or to be condemned. It doesn't talk about, um, well, essentially, when we obey the law as Christians, that is not being under the law. Uh, under the law is where the whole world is, under the covenant of works, unless they turn to Jesus and then they're under the covenant of grace. Then they obey the law for another reason. But that's, that's what we're going to get to in, in this sermon. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Why did God give us the law? Now let me just back up for a moment and say that this month, as I've already mentioned, we're looking at Luther and the Reformation. And remember the Reformation is that revival that the Lord brought in the 16th century. And I hope these words aren't taken Wrong. I'm not trying to slam anybody by saying this, but this revival broke the tyranny of the Roman church. And by the way, in those days, it wasn't called the Roman church. In those days, it was the church. That was the only church that existed. But it, it had basically tyranny. It was, holding, it was exerting tyranny over the souls of men. Everybody was locked in its grip because if you wanted to get into the kingdom of heaven, you essentially had to go through the church. That was the only way. And we're going to see something more about that this evening. So they had tyranny over the souls of mankind. And we're going to look at that revival and we're going to look at the man that the Lord used to begin that revival. Now, 
In the past, we've noticed or noted that there were other men and movements that the Lord actually brought prior to Luther to begin this work, and we don't want to forget about them. And I'm just going to just summarize them quickly, and that's essentially all we're going to look at except for what um, Sproul will bring out in the series this evening. The Lord raised up the Waldenses, or the Waldensians, as they're more commonly known, a movement that was founded by Peter Waldo. And again, when you hear the word Waldo, you probably think of where's Waldo. That's certainly not, uh, you know, what it's talking about here. Waldo, Waldensian, I think you see the relationship. Waldo was a merchant and a theologian of the 12th century who advocated voluntary poverty. He didn't believe that we should be seeking after riches. Strict adherence to the Bible, lay preaching, and he commissioned a translation of the Bible into the common language of the people. That's a common theme that, it, that reoccurs through these earlier reformers. He raised up John Wycliffe, who was a professor of theology at Oxford in the 14th century, who wanted to bring the church back to the scriptures as the sole source of authority. It's essentially where Luther is going to find the truth in the Bible, not in the church. He consequently, that is, uh, John Wycliffe, translated the New Testament from the Latin Vulgate into the common language of the time. And by the way, that's the reason why we don't use the John Wycliffe translation today. For one thing, English in the 14th century wasn't exactly modern English. It wasn't even King James English. You wouldn't even recognize what, what the language was, essentially. But he also translated it from the Vulgate, which is a Latin translation of, of the, the Hebrew and Greek scriptures, which means whatever errors crept into the Vulgate would, would creep, creep into his translation. So, but it was still important that he wanted to get the Bible into the language of the people. Wycliffe also commissioned a group of itinerant preachers to preach New Testament truths from village to village. He called them, uh, well, actually, they were known as the Lollards. He raised up John Huss, whose students, while they were studying in Oxford, contemporary with John Wycliffe, copied Wycliffe's writings. You know, if you wanted to take a book with you, you had to copy it out by hand. The printing press hadn't been, you know, invented yet. So they copied down Wycliffe's writings and they brought them all back to Prague and John Huss read them. They influenced him to institute similar reforms and for that he was burned at the stake. Um, we'll hear more about Huss this evening about the idea that, uh, you know, your goose is cooked basically essentially comes from Huss and the fact that he was burned at the stake. But Huss's writings influenced Luther. Now, there were many others that the Lord raised up, but as you know, the man most remembered for beginning the Reformation, the reforming of the church that started and actually took hold for the first time in, in history, uh, with the nailing of his 95 theses to the church door in, in Wittenberg or Wittenberg, which, as we know, was the call for a public debate on the abuse of indulgences, is Martin Luther. By the way, I mentioned earlier, and Sproul is going to reverse this theory because apparently there's differing views of when Luther was actually converted. Some believe that he was converted uh, after he nailed those 95 theses. Some believe he was converted before, and Sproul believes he was converted before. But the interesting thing here is that these theses really didn't have anything to do with salvation. They had to do with indulgences. Not that they were wrong to use them, but that they were being abused. So there's just no indications from that that Luther had, you know, had the, the gospel revealed to him because that was far more important than indulgences. But Luther may have been beginning small. But what is it the Lord used to begin his work in Luther that made him move in this direction to become this great reformer? Well, he began his work by giving Luther a deep concern for the eternal well-being of his soul. I mean, Luther read the scriptures, and he knew by comparing his life to what God said our lives should be, something that his schooling as a lawyer helped him to do, he knew he was guilty, and he knew he was on his way to judgment before a holy God. And he also knew the church of his day was not able to give him any real help because it had lost its way. Essentially, it had lost God's way. The only way that we can have peace with God and peace of conscience, that we can know the forgiveness of sins. They had lost the gospel. 
And by the way, the, one of the largest tragedies, tragedies today is the fact that even after the Reformation, the Roman Church solidified its position against the Protestants, and they still continue to hold those positions today. They still do not have the gospel. And we'll, we'll see that un, unfold as we, as we go along in this series. Now, what Luther experienced, this, this terror of, of the judgment of God, is something that we all have experienced, at least at some level, if we have come to Jesus. And before we come to Jesus, uh, one way of putting it is we first, before coming to Jesus, had to go to Mount Sinai. Um, you know, in Pilgrim's Progress, I was just thinking he came to Calvary, and, uh, but he did go to Sinai before he went to Calvary. Remember, Mr. Worldly Wiseman said, you know, you need to go to the town of morality. In order to get there, you've got to go up this, this hill uh, that's Sinai. And as he's going up it, it's, it's getting steeper and steeper and more fiery, and it's going to fall down upon his head, and he thought he was going to be destroyed. But you have to go to Sinai before you come to Jesus. Now, Jeff, Jeff Thomas, who is a Reformed pastor from the UK, and we're a little bit familiar with him because uh, we used to watch these series of videos from the Aberystwyth Conference, and he was one of the speakers. We saw a few of his sermons a, a few years ago. Uh, said this about membership interviews in the Church of Scotland uh, that were going on in his day. So this is what Jeff Thomas says. He says, in Scotland... There might have been a question, uh, or excuse me, there might be a question asked by an elder when someone was being interviewed for, for membership in the church. Not my question of why God should let you into heaven, but rather this unusually phrased question, have you been to Sinai? That was the question they asked, have you been to Sinai? The elder was not, of course, asking, had they been to the peninsula of Sinai in the Middle East on a Holy Land bus tour, but had they been to the place where God made them feel the power of his law, touching <clears throat> their conscience with the, in, the searching inward probing of the Ten Commandments and making them feel they were fearful slaves to sin. Have you understood that by the works and deeds of law-keeping, no one can be saved and you are no exception? Then what is left for you to do? You can only flee for salvation to the one who perfectly did all that God's law required in order to take him as your savior. You see, you have to visit Sinai at some point in your life if you were to come to the Lord Jesus Christ because why would you ever trust Jesus? Why would you ever reach out to him? Why would you ever look for him and try to find the solution to sin if you really had no concern at all for your soul, if you didn't see your need of Jesus? That's, that's why the Lord gave the law of God. That's why God sent John the Baptist to, you know, to preach and to teach the law and repentance. You'll notice that, that John the Baptist, he, he indicted the people. He convicted the people. They kept asking him what to do, and he told them what to do. This is how you need to amend. But he kept pointing to the one who was coming after him. The reason he went before Jesus was to get them ready by preaching the law of God. The Lord first brought his holiness through the law of God home to Luther's conscience before he showed him the way to escape his wrath through his son. Now this morning, what I want us to consider is that God gave the law to convict us of our sins and to convince us of our helplessness in order that he might drive us to Jesus. There's actually a gracious reason why the Lord gives us his law. Actually, there's, all of the reasons are gracious because he actually gave the law to us for three reasons. The first one is the one we're going to focus on, so I'll just mention it briefly, and it's also the first reason that he gives it to us. He gave it to us to point us to Jesus so that we might be justified. Now, we're going to come back to that in a moment. He gave it to us second so that having been justified by Jesus, declared righteous by God as fit to enter into heaven through the forgiveness of his cross, and, being, and by being clothed with his perfect righteousness. Jesus points us back to the law to teach us how we are to live for his glory. 
how to live a life of thankfulness. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, to his disciples who trusted in him, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We can't love Jesus and not keep his commandments. And the commandments he's referring to here are the ones that are his Father's commandments. They belong to Jesus too. They are the Ten Commandments. And when he's talking here about obedience, he's not talking about the obedience that the scribes and Pharisees were offering to him by just mimicking or imitating outwardly what the Lord wants them to do to sort of keep up appearances, but inwardly in our thoughts and our desires from the heart because we love him and, of course, directed at one goal in particular, and that is his glory. We will obey him because we want to honor him, because we love him. R.C. Sproul writes uh, this regarding our relationship to the law of God, having come to Jesus Christ. He says, by studying or meditating on the law of God, we attend the school of righteousness. We learn what pleases God and what offends him. The moral law that God gave, or excuse me, the, the moral law that God reveals in Scripture is always binding upon us. Our redemption is from the curse of God's law, not from our duty to obey it. We are justified not because of our obedience to the law, but in order that we may become obedient to God's law. To love Christ is to keep his commandments, to love God is to obey his law. Now, that we're going to look at a bit more carefully when we return to the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the third use of the law is to restrain sin, both in the believer and the unbeliever. Now, with regard to the unbeliever, John Calvin writes this in his Institutes. He says that it's useful by means of its fearful denunciations and the consequent dread of punishment to curb those who, unless forced, have no regard for rectitude and justice. That's how it restrains unbelievers. And I want you to notice here, he says it curbs them. It does not stop them. Now, it curbs them in particular if they've heard it and, and they know if they happen to be going to a church and hearing the Word of God preach. But it also stops them, or curbs them, I should say, not stops them, but it curbs them even when they haven't heard it. Because everybody knows God exists. Even the unbelievers who have never been to church and have never seen a Bible, everybody knows that God exists. Paul writes this in Romans 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, from that time forward, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. No one has any excuse. Everybody knows that God exists. They see it through the creation. But everybody also knows what God requires. They also know something of the law. They still have an understanding of the law left over from the fall. And the Spirit, essentially the Spirit of God may be the one who essentially creates this or causes it to happen. Others believe that it's a remnant of our originally being made in the image of God, having that original love for God that, and an understanding of his law. But the Spirit uses that to curb sin. They may not be able to tell you what that law of God is, but they can tell you when they've broken it because their consciences tell them. You know, the word conscience means with knowledge. And it simply means that there is this understanding of the law of God and they understand that they have broke it broken it. You know, it's also true that they understand something of the penalty of breaking that law. I mean, what is it their conscience is telling they're guilty of breaking it, but why are they afraid? Because of the consequences. Paul actually continues in Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, and I would ask you to pay careful attention to his closing words here. He says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, they had this revelation, but they would not acknowledge God. They would not give him thanks. They worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. God was giving them over to their sins. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, 
malice. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And now catch this. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. The law of God restrains the sin of unbelievers, but it doesn't stop them. Uh, it's interesting that he's talking about people who just have natural revelation and they know that what God requires and they know it deserves death if they break it, but they still do it. But the law of God kind of puts the brakes on that somewhat. Now, the law of God can also help us as Christians Sometimes the fact that we're saved by grace and not by works, sometimes that takes away the only motivation we seem to have to obey. You know, well, Jesus has done it all. I used to refer to it as the gospel train. You know, you just get your ticket, trust in Jesus, get on the train, sort of recline, and wait as the train takes you to heaven. That's not the picture the Bible gives to us. The Bible tells us that we need to be serving the Lord. You know, we need to be living for his glory according to his will. But we lose that sight sometimes by the fact that we're saved by grace. I mean, if I'm not saved by my works and I'm going to heaven anyway, why does obedience really matter? And it can also make us think that it doesn't matter if we sin. You know, because maybe God will even use my sin to bring good. The Bible says that he does that. And that God even glorifies his grace and his mercy through our sins by forgiving our sins in the Lord Jesus Christ. And some people actually came to the conclusion from that in Paul's day that it was a good thing to sin so that God could be glorified. Paul's teaching was caricatured in that way. And so he had some pretty strong things to say about that. He says in Romans chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, But if through my lie the law of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. Now, whenever we're tempted to think that, you know, that it doesn't matter whether I obey, it doesn't matter whether I sin, we should remember the things that we're about to look at, what sin really deserves. And we should also remember that even though we are saved, purely by the work of Jesus Christ, it still matters whether or not we obey. Not only is it the evidence that we love him, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, the evidence that we're really saved, but it's the basis upon which the Lord is going to reward us when we stand before him on the day of his judgment. So the Lord gives his law for essentially three reasons, to drive us to Jesus, then Jesus points us back to the law to teach us how to live, but the law is always there to restrain the unbeliever's sin and, and our sin. But now let's get back to that first use of the law. How God gave it to prepare us to receive his grace. Paul writes in Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. And how the law does that? It does it by condemning us. Remember what Paul says in Galatians 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now, what is it that Luther saw that terrified him, that made him look for forgiveness? The forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ alone, that forgiveness that he couldn't find in the church. What is it that we need to see if we haven't yet come to Jesus Christ? Well, we need to see God's holiness. That's what Luther saw, the holiness of God and his wrath against sin. That's something that we often forget about in Christian circles because if we've trusted Jesus, we've been delivered from it, but we need to remember it for the sake of those out there, but also for our sakes so that we don't go on sinning and think it's okay. It isn't it isn't okay. It costs Jesus' life to cleanse us of those sins. So what do we need to see? Well, first of all, we do need to see that we have all sinned. 
and that sin brings guilt. That's what the law of God shows us. Romans 7, verses 7 and 8. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. That's the reason why. And in our text, we also saw through the law comes the knowledge of sin. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. Now, the law does not make us sin. The law is not sin. The law simply shows us the sin that's already in our hearts, and even more than that, without Jesus Christ, it provokes that sin. You tell me I can't do this, I'll show you that I can't. And that's essentially how unbelievers respond to the law of God. I'm not going to obey that. But the believer will say, that's good and that's right. And that's what I want to do because I love God. But that's because we have the Holy Spirit. He's changed our hearts. He's given us the ability to obey. Now, the law shows us our sin. It stirs up sin. And the scriptures show us that that sin is universal. All of us have sinned. There are no exceptions. Again, Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we need to understand that sin, or that the law of God shows us our sin, that we've all sinned and we're all guilty. Secondly, we need to see what sin deserves. It deserves death. Paul writes in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's the curse he speaks of in Galatians 3.10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, as long as you're still trying to work your way to heaven, you're under this curse. This curse of death, the death that was threatened Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden. On the day that you eat of this, you shall surely die. Now, they didn't die physically, and this death is not physical death, although it does bring about physical death eventually, but it's judicial death. It's the sentence of everlasting death, what the Bible calls hell. Now, here's where we need to begin to look a little bit more at, at this, because this is what the holiness of God demands, a just penalty for the crime. Now, what is hell? Okay, now, hell is not as many well-meaning Bible teachers teach, and I've heard it when I was in other churches, this is what they teach, that essentially hell is where God is not. Hell is a place where God has created, he has created for the devil and his angels, and people go there, and essentially when they go there, they're cut off from the goodness of God, and that's what hell is. It's a fiery place, it's a painful place, but God is not there. But that's not what hell is. Hell is not the absence of God. Hell is the presence of God, but not in his blessing. It's the presence of God in his judgment. Jonathan Edwards once wrote that God is the fire that burns in hell. Now, that may paint a different picture of God in our minds of maybe what we're used to, but he is the one who punishes sin. He is the one who is justly punishing those who have committed these crimes against him. That is his wrath that is going on in there. So it's not his absence. It is his presence. And that is what sin deserves. That's the death, the curse of sin. Now, thirdly, we need to see that differing sins deserve different degrees or levels of punishment. There are differing degrees of sin. Not every sin is the, is the same. I mean, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. You'll notice that as the infractions ramp up, so do the punishments. Now, sin can deserve greater or less punishment uh, depending upon the action itself. But it can also depend on how much we know about God's will, how much light we sin against. Jesus says in Luke 12, verses 47 through 48, And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will, 
he will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it, his master's will, and committed deeds worthy of a flogging, will receive but few. You see, the punishment depended upon how much the person knew about what his master wanted. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples when he sent them out to preach, remember, to share the good news to people who had never heard the good news before. Matthew 10, verses 14 through 15, whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Look into the Old Testament. Remember what it is that Sodom and Gomorrah were guilty of. Pretty serious sin. God destroyed those cities because of their sin. Jesus says, if you go to a town and they don't listen to you, it's going to be worse for them because the gospel, the kingdom of heaven came near. They had this light, this truth. They knew what God wanted and they did not receive him and turned against him. You know, there is a reason why there is a day of judgment for unbelievers. And, you know, it's not just to prove that they deserve the, the punishment that they're on their way to because you could just bypass judgment essentially and just send them all there, but it's also to weigh how much punishment they actually deserve. Paul writes in Romans 2, verses 5 through 6, speaking of the unbeliever, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. Not just generically, you did evil, you, you're going to get this, you did good, you're going to get this, but Jesus said even every careless word that men speak, they're going to have to give an accounting for it on the day of judgment. And the reason being is because it's going to determine the level of punishment that they're going to have to face for eternity. Now, what makes it even worse than this, and again, we haven't talked about you know, the fact that it's represented as a place of darkness and, and fire and weeping and gnashing of teeth, just the agony that the people are involved in. But Judgment Day may very well just set the starting point of that punishment, not in time only, but in intensity. Uh, it, it, jo Joseph Bellamy had this hypothesis, and he said, you know, Judgment Day is going to be to weigh how much sin we've committed while on earth to determine what our punishment's going to be in hell. But what about the sins that are committed in hell? People don't stop sinning once the Day of Judgment passes. They continue to blaspheme God and hate God and hate those around them while they're in hell. What about those sins? Well, Joseph Bellamy, who was a disciple of Jonathan Edwards and a pastor in New England in the 1700s, he said those sins are also going to be weighed against them and it's going to increase their judgment more and more and more. Jonathan Edwards seemed to have agreed with him because he wrote the, uh, basically the endorsement for his book when it was published originally and he basically said you should read this book because it's good. It's this, you, you need to hear these things. And that would mean then that, that hell, or not, not the hell that exists right now, but the lake of fire, is essentially a whirlpool that, that's bottomless and people are continually sinking deeper and deeper into it to, to increasing levels of punishment throughout eternity. And, and how, can we, how can we paint that? I mean, how can we see the reality of that? How can we know what they're really experiencing? We, well, we can't. And hopefully we never will, by the grace of God. If we're trusting in Jesus, we certainly never will. But really, we need to understand something of it. Now, finally, we need to understand that hell is also forever. There's nothing that anyone in hell can do to escape this punishment. John writes in Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night. If we were to look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you know, or, you know, we, we would see that um, Abraham tells the rich man that there's this chasm and, and this is where you're going to be. You're going to stay there. We're going to stay here. And your punishment, there's no comfort for you, not even a drop of water to cool the, the tip of your tongue. As Edwards would point out, here's something else to think about. That situation that Jesus was describing, which is a real situation, right? Right? 
um, they were just spirits at that time. They did not have their resurrection bodies, and so they were comforted spiritually. They were being tormented spiritually. But there's going to come a day of resurrection and a day of judgment, and then the wicked are going to be cast into hell again or into the lake of fire, and there they're going to be again to experience another dimension to their suffering. It's going to be more physical and spiritual rather than just spiritual alone. So in other words, their judgment will increase after the day of judgment, but if Bellamy is right, it's going to increase even more throughout time, and we need to understand that that time is limitless. Now, this is why. If we commit sins against one another, those crimes we commit are worthy of limited punishment if the injury that we inflict is all that's taken into account, what one man does to another. But everything that we do, every sin that we commit, is not committed just against the people we commit them against. It's committed against God who commands us to live in a particular way. He tells us to love our neighbor. And when we don't love our neighbor, we're actually sinning against God as well as our neighbor. Now, the penalty against what we do to our neighbor may be limited, and that's what you know, our justice system is supposed to reflect now. But what, does the, the, what should the penalty be for the crimes we commit against God, who is infinitely worthy? You see, that's what Luther was looking at. He knew what he deserved. He knew that, that God was worthy of, our, of all of our love and, and of everything we could possibly give him, but he knew he didn't love him, and he, we're going to hear that sometimes Luther says, sometimes I hated God, you know, I mean, and really we come into this world actually hating God. But what does, that, what does that actually require? What's the just penalty for that? Well, a crime against an infinitely worthy being is infinite punishment, but we can't be punished infinitely so we must be punished indefinitely. That is a very long time. You see, we can never satisfy the, the justice of God because we could never suffer enough for what we have actually done against him. And that is, if we're outside of Jesus Christ, if we're in him, he is God in human flesh. He is infinitely worthy. And his suffering was enough to pay the price, but only his suffering. Our suffering never will, which is why it would go on forever. Thomas Watson once illustrated endless time, and I think it was a helpful illustration. He said, picture the world, you know, this planet, and he had really didn't have a full concept of how big it is, but picture this planet as a giant ball of sand made up of many little grains of sand. And every one million years, a bird flies by the planet and brushes its wing against the planet, against, you know, this, this earth, and brushes off one grain of sand. He says, when that bird will have brushed away the entire planet, then one moment will have passed in the endless stretches of time ahead of us. Every million years, one grain of sand. When that's worn down, there's an endless number of worlds yet to be worn down because time never comes to an end. And just as that never comes to an end, so also does the punishment of those who are in hell. It never comes to an end. Now, what was Luther afraid of? Well, he was afraid of the prospect of facing a holy God, of facing God's wrath in hell for the sins that he knew that he was guilty of for the rest of time. And he may not even had a concept of this idea of, of, you know, perhaps even degrees of punishment, I think he did, or the fact that it continues to get worse once you're there. But he did know he was guilty. He did know that that's what the just sentence of his crimes were. And that that is how God appeared to him. And it's because of that. He went through such great lengths to find God's forgiveness when he couldn't find it in the church because the church lost the way of forgiveness when they lost the gospel. Now, thankfully, we live in a post-Reformation era and we know how to find this forgiveness, at least if we're in a Protestant church. We know it's by trusting Jesus alone. And let me just again remind you this morning, if you have trusted Jesus, you're safe. You're not going to have to face that. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. But we're not going to have to face that because Jesus endured that on the cross. So we would not have to. He made a full payment, fully satisfying God's justice. That is what is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ.
But if you haven't trusted Jesus, you do need to understand that this is what you are still in danger of. And if that's true of you, and if you're afraid like Luther was afraid, then trust Jesus as he offers himself to you. I mean, Jesus is offering himself to people around the world every Lord's Day. And certainly when people you know, are witnessing to other people and doing evangelism, he is, he is often offering himself. And he says that if you will come to him, he will forgive you. He will clothe you with his righteousness. He will take away your fear. Jesus said on one occasion, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. That is what Jesus offers to all who see their need of Jesus. If you see your need, come to him and he will freely receive you. But if you haven't trusted him and you're not afraid and you're not weary and you're not burdened and so you don't see a need to come to Jesus, then may the Lord wake you up through his law through his spirit, through conscience, that you might escape the danger that you're in. Because there is a coming day of judgment when you will have to stand before him. And Jesus is the only way of escape. You must trust him. So may the Lord show you your need of him if you haven't trusted him and you are unconcerned that you might come uh, to him. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And as we do, let's also bear in mind as we look forward to um, the Lord's table this morning that Jesus gave us this, uh, this ordinance, this sacrament of the Lord's Supper to remind us of what he did for us, how he took our punishment on himself that we would escape it. So let, let, let's pray.